Da 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 da. Oh, I've done all that. I've done all that. Where am I supposed to be starting today? Oh, I did did that. Did that. Oh, I'm going backwards. Yeah. Oh. Start here Wednesday. I did that. I, oh, I didn't do that. Great. Right, so we're going to prove the global Langlands conjectures for GL1 over a number field today. Right now, right? This is kind of crazy. So here's the setup. Uh, so w what do we know, right? Compatible, compatible systems of one-dimensional Galois representations, example, right? Examples. Let's have K is Q. This is what we did at the very beginning of the example. Example, at the very beginning of that last lecture, we had a Dirichlet character, chi. And that, that was the one that was a lie. We just had a Dirichlet character, chi. There was a Gawa representation to GL1 of a number field with finite image. And we just pretended it was a compatible system of one-dimensional Gawa representations by just embedding the number field into the piadic fields. <laughs> right? So take Q, take Q of I. That's a quadratic extension. The Gawa group is cyclic of order 2. Let's take the character of that group that sends the identity to one and complex conjugation to negative one, right? There's a, rep there's a complicated representation of gal Q bar of a Q. This image is plus or minus one. And now let's just pretend plus or minus one are p-adic numbers, L-adic numbers. For all primes L, there's a compatible system of one-dimensional gal representations. That's a bit of a lame example. More interesting example, example two, cyclotomic character. Cyclotomic character to the power n. Okay, and you can multiply them together. Example three, take a product. Okay, that will also work, nice and easy, right? Because you get the, you get F, P, F, P of X is just chi of P times P to the N, right? For every, for every L-adic representation, uh, L not P, a Frobenius at P will go to chi of P times P to the N, and that's independent of L. Uh, so there you go. So the upshot is, all, I'm not claiming I know what all the compatible systems of one-dimensional Gower representations are, but I'm saying that if K is Q, I can think of an example, you give me a pair, give it a Dirichlet character and an integer, right? And now Gerson characters, well, we're really good at those now, Gerson, GCs, Gerson characters, GC uh, of, you know, GC of Q star over AQ star, uh, remember, that's just isomorphic to z hat star across the positive reals. So I want to give a Grerson character for Q, uh, then I have to give a character for this guy here, which is a Dirichlet character chi, and then I have to give a character uh, of the positive reals, which is a complex number S. Okay? So the Grerson characters, uh, a Dirichlet character, and a complex number. And the compatible systems of one-dimensional representations that we can think of are a, Grerson ca uh, sorry, a, a Dirichlet character and an integer. Okay? So there's some sort of, they're not quite the same. And this isn't quite the global Langdon's conjectures, but you can somehow see there's, the problem is there's too many Grerson characters. Right? I'll quote from Richard Taylor's notes. He defined a Grerson character. He didn't do any examples. <laughs> and then he just wrote, there are too many of these. <laughs> and what he, re what he really means by that uh, is that there are too many. I mean, the complex numbers are quite a scary thing if you're a number theorist, because you're used to countable stuff. So there's too many Grerson characters. So here's a definition then, right? A Grerson character for a general number field K, this is back to general K, a Grerson character for, a, you know, uh, of, of AK's, whatever, of AK's, uh, a, a Grerson character, whatever, for K star over AK star. The character of this field is said to be algebraic. Right, algebraic, 
if when restricted to k infinity star, right? K infinity star is where all the action, you know, is where all the, the real numbers and the complex stuff, so all the, sort of the slightly scary stuff looks like. If when restricted to k infinity star, uh, it better have a name. A gross encoder, what's a good name for it? Psi, right? A Grossen character is said to be algebraic if when restricted to k infinity star, all those scary complex numbers are whole numbers. <laughs> if when restricted to k infinity star, psi looks like this. It's a map from k infinity star to c star. And this, remember, this is isomorphic to R star, well, let me restrict it to the connected component because it would just make your life a lot easier. Uh, there's, there's just an annoying plus or minus one thing. If restricted, to, this means connected component. It means, don't, it means forget about all the reals, let's just do the positive reals. Uh, so this looks like the positive reals to the power of R1 across the complex numbers to the power of R2. Okay. Uh, psi looks like this, psi of whatever, x1, x2, dot, 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 xr, z1, z2, dot, 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 zs, right, r is r1, s is r2, this is some standard notation for some people. That has to equal, uh, so what, what am I allowed here? If you think about it, I'm really allowed loads. I'm allowed R complex numbers, and then I'm allowed S. I guess they would be complex numbers as well, right? Uh, psi looks like this. Well, yeah. It, when restricted to K infinity star circle, uh, well, we just have psi, psi of, let me just write the equation, x1, x2, up to xr, z1, z2, up to zs, it just must be x1 to the power n1, x2 to the power n2, xr to the power nr, z1 to the power nr plus 1, z2, z1 bar, I'm totally allowing bars, because I can't tell z from z bar, to the n r plus 2, z 2 to the n r plus 3, z 2 bar to the n r plus 4, right, dot, 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 right, with all the n i, all integers. Okay, so that's the formal official definition of an algebraic Grossen character. So there's two different things going on at play. There's two different things into play here, right? There's, there's the fact that you can't choose those ends randomly because there's some equation coming from the units of K. So those ends aren't quite completely free, but whatever the equations are, there, there better be solutions in integers somehow. Uh, so I'm putting two conditions on all those s's at infinity. Firstly, I'm saying, well, it comes from a Grossen character, so there's some equations involving units. Uh, and then conversely, all those copies of the positive reals floating around, you're not allowed to use random complex numbers, you have to use integers, right? So e.g., e.g., cyclotomic, this norm character, right? Norm from k star to a k star, when you unravel it to c star to Z star, this turns out to be algebraic. Okay, and all the ends, all the ends are one. Right? So it's not, it's not a big mysterious thing. And when we did, you know, K is Q, we did A Q star, A Q star over Q star to C star, and we said, we observed that this is z hat star across the positive reals. And on that positive reals, this thing here went from x goes to x to the power s. Right? That was, that's, a, that's what a random Grossen character looks like for q. It's a Dirichlet character, and there's a character at infinity, which is x goes to x to the power s. Okay? For s, a random complex number. Right? That character there, it's algebraic if and only if s is an integer, okay? So this is, this, is a, this is the definition that we've been missing. 
there's too many Gerson characters because we have an entire, I mean, they're beautiful things, right? And it's really, you have to remember, if you want to understand L functions, you do need to keep track of all of them. But a whole bunch of these things are not algebraic, right? And so now you have to make a big, there's, there's a big decision you have to make in your life now, right? You have to decide, are you going to be a philosopher or are you going to be a mathematician, right? So, so here's the philosophy, right? Philosophy. If I've got, if Kai is, an, is a Gerson character, oh, GC. If Kai is a Gerson character for K, or, you know, which is a really, you know, which is a nice brief way of saying equals an automorphic representation for GL1 over K, that turns out to be that by definition. So I've got an automorphic representation for GL1 over K, then if you believe Langland's philosophy, that should give me a one-dimensional representation of the global Langland's group, right? Of the global Langland's group. Group uh, LQ, LK. Okay, there's the, and that should be a bijection, right? So, and that's just like, this is, this has no definition, right? This is a meaningless object. Okay, and the reason that we make this conjecture, the reason we make this conjecture is because it's a guy, it gives us a guiding principle. So like, let's pretend there's a group LK, then we could imagine restricting to a finite index subgroup, and that might correspond to something on the other side, and that will give us hints about how to build new automorphic forms from old ones by doing trivial group theory on this side and deducing, you know, that there should be some strange functoriality principle going on on the other side. But this group, this is not actually a conjecture. This is a philosophy, right? But let me tell you a theorem, which is due to ve. Okay? If I've got, if chi is an algebraic Gerson character, So that means that complex number S is an integer, then lo and behold, then there exists a compatible sequence. Sorry, see what is compatible, what's the word? System. A compatible system of, L of lambda adic Galois representations, representations attached to chi, attached to chi. Right? If all the random complex numbers turn out to be whole numbers, then there's nothing stopping us doing this land radic representations attached to chi. Okay? And converse is true as well. And the converse. Given the compatible system, the system gives rise to, a, to an algebraic Gerson character. So I'm going to prove this. Uh, and we did all that warm-up before, so we, what, is, what is the proof? I mean, I'm, I'm going to use class fill theory, because I'm supposed to be coming up with representations of a Galois group, so I need to know something about the Galois group, and that Galois group's got something to do with the Adels. Right? Here, let me, before I prove it, let me tell you, the, here's, here's why the proof isn't going to be, it's completely trivial. Right? Here's, here's why the proof actually needs something. Here's the idea. Right? We've got chi, an algebraic Gerson character, to C star, okay? Chi restricted to K infinity star, the connected component, isn't one, right? Is kind of X goes to kind of X to the N sort of thing. Right? That's kind of what it looks like, okay? It's just got whole numbers in. Uh, but what we want... We want a representation, gal q bar over, well, gal k bar over k to g l1 of q l bar, right? I, there's some number field e0, that's going to come in somehow, but whatever e0 is, it's going to be some number field and some, there'll be this, right? Gal, gal, this thing here, and remember, what is this? This is a k star, that looks kind of good so far, over k star, that looks good so far, 
over k infinity star circle topological closure. And this doesn't look good, right? Because this representation here is kind of, it can be complicated, right? These integers can really exist. Right? There are plenty of, like, the norm character, you get n equals 1. The norm character, I want the answer to be the cyclotomic character. So there's some fishy business going on here. Uh, if this Grerson character was really kind of completely, if it was just trivial here, then that would be fine. That would be like a Dirichlet character. Right? If this Grerson character was trivial at infinity. So we've got these n's, and we're going to have to make them go away. We, so we need to manipulate the Grerson character until it's trivial at infinity. Okay? So that's why this proof has some kind of content. So this is an old theorem of eight, and it's probably in his book on basic number theory, which is a book that I heard so many bad things about that even though I'm nearly 50, I've still never opened that book. So I've got no idea what's in Vey's book, basic number theory. That's the one, that's the pig in the garden story, is it? I can't remember. Uh, maybe I won't tell the pig in the garden story. So anyway, Vey wrote a book, it's probably quite good. Uh, it might contain a proof of this. Sorry, Brian, I never read it. It's like, I'm sure I'll get a stroppy email from Brian telling me what page the proof is on. Uh, here's the proof. I'm just going to show you the proof. Uh, right. Then this, is, this is the nearest we're going to get to the proof of the global Langdon's conjecture, so you better enjoy this. Right? This is, this, like, after this, it's just waffle. Two days of waffle. We've got a Grerson character. What's the theorem? Okay, so I've got given chi, given chi from k star over a k star to c star. And it's algebraic. And the first thing I'm going to do is let me define. Uh, yeah, oh, I'm going to need notation. Let's say. Let's say chi restricted to k. We know it's algebraic, right? It's algebraic. That's the one thing we know. So let me write down what algebraic means. So chi restricted to k infinity star connected component uh, of, of, a, of an x infinity, as it were. What is that? Uh, this is the product for v real xv to the power of nv uh, for nv an integer times the product for v corresponding to sigma and uh, c sigma complex. So I just have a number xv uh, and that's kind of a complex number so maybe it's kind of sigma of xv uh, to the nv1 times sigma of xv bar to the nv2. There we go. So x infinity is just all these xv's for v in infinite place. So that's just setting up notation, right? All the nv's are integers. That's what we know, and that's what we've got to get rid of. Uh, so let's just get rid of it, right? Let's just divide by it. <laughs> let's define... Let's define chi zero from the idels to C star simply by, by chi zero of x. It's just chi of x. There's our Grerson character. And now let's just divide by all this stuff. Divided by the product for v real xv to the minus nv. Let's just put it in brackets. XV to the NV. Oh, I, was com I had complaints yesterday from Edna about this. Divide. Is that okay? A proper American divide, none of this weird European notation. V real XV to the NV. Was, no, you were just complaining that you couldn't see the dots, wasn't it? I'll tell you what. There's... What about that? Perfect. Now we're all happy. X, there we go. XV to the NV. Uh, what am I doing? What's going on at infinity? Oh, yeah, I'm going to do product, product over whatever, V complex. Same notation, right? Sigma, sigma XV to the NV1, uh, to sigma, sigma XV bar to the NV2. 
Okay, I'm just dividing by, I've just written that again. Remember what we're trying to do, we're trying to get something, we're trying to get some, how am I possibly going to write down a Gower representation, obviously I'm going to use class fill theory, okay, because this, this abelian, this abelianized Gower group is isomorphic to this, and this is something that we kind of, you know, we've got functions on this already. So here's a function, I, the, you know, I've got this problem, it's not right at infinity, so I've fixed it infinity, but as you can imagine, you try and fix it in one place, and then it's kind of gone all wrong at some other place. Uh, so what's, what's, what's happened now is that... What's happened now is that chi zero... Chi zero is now trivial on k infinity... No, k infinity star connected component, right? Because uh, I've just kind of divided by, it was, some, it was something, there was a formula at infinity, and I've just divided by the same formula. So it's trivial on k infinity star zero, so you kind of think, great, we're, we're, kind of, we're going to be there, right? That's somehow what we wanted. But it's non-trivial, so chi zero is now non-trivial on k star. You see, we can't get this for free. Chi, this original chi was trivial on this globally diagonally embedded K star, uh, but it was, you know, complicated at infinity, and I've divided by what was happening at infinity, and now if you think about it, if I've got an element of K star, it's embedded diagonally, so at infinity, this X, you know, if I've got lambda in K star, this is just lambda, and so I've got a bunch of lambdas and conjugates of lambda, I've got conjugates of lambda to some random powers, right? Chi zero is now non-trivial on K star, you see, so we haven't finished the proof. So kind of chi zero, chi zero of lambda is just going to be, when you unravel it, it's just going to be some product for sigma going from k to c, sigma of lambda to some power, right, n sigma, where sigma, you can kind of imagine, like, if v is the real embedding, then n v is n sigma, and if, you know, there's just some... And this is just some random, these n sigmas are kind of random whole numbers. Right? So, for example, if all the n sigmas are equal to, if we did the norm character, all the n sigmas would be equal to 1, uh, and this would just be the norm of lambda. So, this would just be a random, uh, a random rational number. Uh, but on the other hand, this is the continuous part, right? You know, on the other, O, T, O, H, on the other hand, chi zero is trivial, on the continuous part. Of, um, of AK star. Uh, and the kind of, what is, how, as is probably clear, I've given, I've given away to you the way I think about AK. AK star is not a product. It's a kind of an irritating subset of a product or slightly bigger than a product. It's not a product. But I still can think of AK star as being built up by some relatively simple things. Firstly, there's K star. Secondly, there's a big product of unit groups. Thirdly, there's the stuff at infinity. And fourthly, there's a kind of a class group, which is just finite. So all of these things are discrete, right? K isn't quite discrete, but we kind of understand what's happening on K here. That big product of compact open things is a pro-finite thing, so that's not going anywhere, right? It's just going to some finite group. The infinite stuff, there's potential there, right? X goes to X to the S, some random complex number. We can have crazy transcendental things in the image of chi if S is some random complex number. Uh, but, in fact, they, they were all integers, and I've just normalized them away. So the infinite place, there's nothing happening at all. So we've got class group is finite. This is controlled. Uh, the compact stuff is finite. The infinite stuff is trivial. Well, I suppose, strictly speaking, it's finite, because that's not all the infinite stuff. There's plus or minus ones in the R star. So I think that, uh, and hence, and so it's not hard to show, and one can now check or oh, one can check, that the image of chi zero, the image of chi zero uh, actually is going to be, will live in E zero, E zero some number field. 
right? Because when you think about it, all these sigmas, I mean, E0 is an explicit subfield of the complexes. Uh, when you think about it, all these sigmas from K to C, they all have image various explicit subfields of C, which are isomorphic to K. So they're all, you know, so finite gamma, you know, they're all finite extensions of Q. And you take the compositum of all these images, and you'll get like the Galois closure of K regarded as a subfield of C. So you start off with the Galois closure of K regarded as a subfield of C, and then any noise coming from extra finite order stuff, you can just throw in and make it a little bit bigger. So E0 is going to be a number field. Uh, well, that's a start, isn't it? We've got M chi 0 living in E0. E0 is a number field. Uh, but we still, but the big problem is, the big problem is that I want a representation of, I've killed, chi zero is trivial here, chi zero is some crazy thing here. But remember the cyclotomic character, the cyclotomic character, let me just remind you, right, the cyclotomic, a k star over k star, k infinity star connected component topological closure, this is gal k bar over k ab, Let's think about the l adic cyclotomic character. Uh, this kind of contains, this contains k lambda star, where lambda is some prime above l, and there's some l adic cyclotomic character here, omega l to z l star. And on k lambda star, this is quite a complicated thing. This is like infinitely ramified, remember. The cyclotomic character is really badly ramified. The l adic cyclotomic character is infinitely ramified at L. So that's the thing we haven't used yet. Our Grerson character is really well behaved at every single finite prime. So I want to take some random lambda adic prime, and then I want to totally screw with chi zero at that prime, right? This is the idea. And I can, I can mess around with it at that one prime and make it all infinitely ramified and find that's absolutely fine. And then, but maybe I can sort out all the problems I have. Maybe I can make this character trivial on K star. It's already trivial at infinity. Maybe if I faff around at some random prime, I can make it trivial here too. So that's exactly how the proof goes. Uh, so here we go. We can check that m chi zero lives in e zero. Now say, now say lambda is a finite place of e zero. Okay. And what we want to do is we want to fix up this. Chi zero is not quite right. <coughs> chi zero is kind of crazy at the finite places. So what I want to do. Uh, I want to look at this chi zero restricted to k star embedded diagonally. We've seen what it is, right? So our lambda goes to some product of sigma of lambda to the n sigma. That's what it looks like, where these n sigmas are integers because the character is algebraic. And you see, that's going to extend, right? This, this number is in E zero, which is a subset of the lambda adic completion, right? So this is a number field, a global field, and here's a random algebraic-looking character to some l adic field. And all these maps are kind of continuous, right? I've got, a, you know, imagine, look, here's like Q star to Q L star, X goes to X to the N. That's what this looks like, right? It's all dressed up with some fancy finite extensions of Q and embeddings, of C, but it just looks a bit like that, only a bit more complicated. And my, the point I want to make is if I've got a map from a number field to an l adic field, which is defined using sensible normal equations in whole numbers, then that's going to extend, right? I'm putting an L there. So chi zero is going to extend continuously. What have I done? Oh, sorry. Curses. Thank you. Now I say lambda is a finite prime. That's the problem with making it up as you go along. There. Have I used the right number of lambdas now? Thank you. So lambda and mu are next to each other in the Greek alphabet, and they're playing utterly unrelated roles, which is not ideal, but still. Uh, my claim is, is that chi zero restricted to k star, this is a map from k star to e, e zero lambda star, this just extends 
extends to a continuous map to a continuous group homomorphism let me call it chi L that's not chi lambda that's chi L uh, it's going to go from k tensor over q q L star uh, to this thing here to E zero lambda star Right? And the proof of that is that's just how life works, right? It's just, you know, you can go away and stare at that and uh, convince, yourself, convince yourself that it's completely trivially obvious. So, uh, on the other hand, you can just believe it, right? Let's just believe it. Uh, and K tensor Q, QL is exactly the product for. P divides L of K completed at P. So there's chi L. So you see chi L, uh, I can just, that's so I can just do it, right? So now let's define, let's define psi, <coughs> let's define psi lambda from AK star to E zero lambda star by just dividing out by this continuous thing. So let's just define psi lambda, psi lambda of some random idel x is going to be chi zero of x, the thing that was uh, and now I just want to divide by chi L. Divided by chi L of XL, which is cunning abbreviation for kind of XP for all P dividing L. Right? If this was if K was the rational numbers, then XL would literally be the point, you know, the number associated to the prime ideal L. Uh, so that's it. Right? So what we've done, psi lambda is now very complicated, very complicated at, uh, at k, whatever, at kp for p divides lambda. But it's really, I haven't changed it anywhere at all, anywhere else, right? I mean, in, 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 take this with a huge grain of salt, but psi lambda equals chi, right? For all... <laughs> on KP, on KP star for all P, not dividing, not dividing L, right? There's just some L, L. so lambda divides L and P. If P divides L, it's complicated. If P, this is meaningless, right? Because this is a lambda adic representation and this is a complex representation. But what I'm suggesting is that both of these representations are taking values in some number field E0, and they're the same. Right? So what we've done, we've messed around at infinity, we've messed around at some finite place L, everything else we've just left it alone. Okay? And now you unravel everything, and you see that this psi lambda, this, was a, this took me a long time to internalize this argument. Uh, one can check that psi lambda is now trivial at infinity, trivial on k infinity star circle, right? And it's trivial on k star embedded diagonally, because I used to have my global k star, which was problematic. Chi zero of this global thing was some complicated thing, but uh, it turns out that complicated thing continues continuously to something that's just going on at L, and so I can just divide by that thing, and now the global thing has got local components, and the global guy goes to some complicated thing, the local guy goes to the same complicated thing, where I divide one by the other, I get trivial on K star. So there's trivial here, trivial here, so that's what we want, right? And it's continuous, therefore extends to a continuous to a continuous k star over a k star over k infinity star circle. And it's continuous, and this is in the kernel, so the closure's in the kernel, to E zero lambda star. There we go. And by class fill theory, this is canonically isomorphic to gal k bar over k. 
ab. I, I'm sick of this proof. I won't say any more. Right, it's compatible. So it's, I mean, you just have to check now. Like, everything else is easy. I've told you the hard part. Uh, that's not, I can't, oh. Uh, let me erase that box. Because I've forgotten what I said the theorem was. I've forgotten how it's, that's the end of the construction, right? End of construction. Right? There. But you might wonder, I mean, I should probably tell you F, you know, F, F P of X is just going to be chi zero of some local uniformizer at P, right? Uh, or is X minus that? Okay, it's a compatible system. So there's Vey's construction. Uh, so let me just say something about going the other way. So the converse is slightly deeper. So the converse, I can't remember if I, if I stay, I mean, the converse, if I have some compatible family, if, chi, if, uh, if psi lambda is a compatible, sequ is a compatible system, uh, th then, then, you know, then fix one lambda, then fix one lambda, and you get that psi lambda is algebraic, right? In some, I mean, you have to, you have to use some, here's the problem. If psi lambda is a compatible system, then uh, to show it comes from a Grerson, to show it comes from an algebraic Grerson character, This is the kind of, this is, let me show you the kind of problem we have to deal with. Uh, we, ha we might have to deal with the following sort of question. Uh, you see, we've got this compatible system, so all these things are taking values in E0, right? So there's some number field E0. E0 is a number field. Right? And now let's say, let's say that we're kind of pretty convinced that it comes from a Grerson character, but we don't know if it's algebraic or not. So here's an example of a Grerson character for Q. We take norm to the power S. For S, a random complex number. That's a Grerson character. Might not be algebraic. It's a Grerson character. But let's say, let's say S is a complex number. And let's say 2 to the power s, 3 to the power s, 5 to the power s, 7 to the power s, dot, dot, dot. Let's say all of those complex numbers, let's say they all, they all land in E0, right? <laughs> so I've got some crazy non-algebraic Grerson character, but when you think about it, there's a chance I can attach a Gower representation to this, because everything's kind of coming out whole numbers. So you've got E0, a number field, you've got a complex number, and then for every prime number P, P to the power S is in E0, for E0, a number field. Well, if S is a whole number, that's fine. But if S is a random complex number, can this happen? That's some delicate question in transcendence theory, right? So that turns out that S is an integer, okay? But this is a result in transcendence theory due to Waldschmidt. Right, the six, you need it's something called. You only need about three primes. It's called something like the six exponentials theorem or something. And maybe if you only had two primes, you'd have to use the four exponentials conjecture, which is some conjecture in transcendence theory. So this just this does use something, but I don't know the first thing about it. So I'm not going to say I'm not going to pretend I do. So. This construction here, given an algebraic Grerson character, I've given you some Galois representations, and given the Galois representations, you can get back to an algebraic Grerson character, but you're going to have to deal with issues like this. Okay? So let me get back to the big picture. How am I doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Uh, let me get back to the big picture. So big picture, uh, 
there, I've got automorphic representations for GL1 over K goes via some nonsense to one-dimensional complex representations of the global Langlands group of K. So there's a meaningless assertion. Uh, and this is to be regarded as a guiding principle for theorems that you should prove about objects which have definitions. So these contain algebraic automorphic representations for GL1 over K. And then by some construction due to V, and then plus some transcendence theory and blah, 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 we get compatible... I mean, if you, Vey goes this way, and whatever, Val Schmidt goes this way. Uh, algebraic automorphisms for GL... Algebraic automorphic representations for GL1 over K, uh, we get compatible systems of one-dimensional L-adic representations of gal k bar over k. And uh, so I don't, you see, I dislike, do I do that? that? That's meaningless, right? That's just, how can I, given a lambda adic representation of a Galois group, how do I get a one-dimensional complex representation of a group whose definition I don't know? So I can't do that. Uh, but I can do that. Okay, so I'm not really here to talk about the Eigen curve and my p-adic fantasies. But maybe these algebraic automorphic representations for GL1 of a K live in p-adic automorphic representations, right? P-adic automorphic representations for GL1 of a K. Right? And so now maybe this now <laughs> You see, automorphic, somehow the infinite place was always different, right? We had all the finite places, and then we had the infinite places. And the infinite places were playing a different role, and I had to keep separating off the finite and the infinite places. And we had, did what's going on at infinity, and somehow infinity was a special prime here, and lo and behold, we get these complex representations here that somehow corresponds to the fact that infinity is playing a different role. So the global Langdon's conjectures, we're saying we have some number field and there's a, special, there's a special place in that number field and it's called infinite places. Right? A, it's, imagine it's Q. We're saying this is a story that's special to the infinite place of Q. This is a story that is completely ambivalent. To, it's just like I don't care. what. There's no infinite place here. Everything is... This is a... This is a really arithmetic object that doesn't really care about finite. Like, you, you know, every, every L, we have some l adic representation. So this is a very kind of fair and equal, you know, this is a very socialist conjecture. So Ve, Ve is going the wrong way. Ve goes this way. So now I want to be, I want to choose, I want to break the symmetry again and choose a special prime number P, and I'll call it P. And so now maybe I've got p adic automorphic representations for GL1 over K. So this is kind of chi. This would then be chi from K star over AK star to, let's say, kind of Q P bar star or something, right? That's what a p adic automorphic representation for GL1 over K is. And they should correspond to... So now you see I've broken the symmetry again. So, and in fact, there is an inclusion this way. There is an inclusion this way, because I just want to stick with the p-adic representations, right? Uh, continuous p-adic representations, right? Gal k bar over k to gl1 of qp bar star. There. And this is probably an exercise by now, I would imagine. Yeah, this is like ex exercise... Why don't you check? Yeah, I should probably do this at some point in my life. So this may or may not work. But uh, if it, why don't you check the why don't you check the p-adic the p-adic global Langlands conjectures conjectures for GL one? Uh, and I think I think the answer should be it's a slightly easier version of Vey's theorem. So I think this is probably a bijection. I should probably check that at some point. Uh,
Yeah, it's, it's in fact, it should probably be very easy. I think it's just, I don't think you even, that's right. The, this was a lot of work because I started with something that was kind of had infinity as a special place and I had to fart around with it to kind of make sure that we had l adic things. I had to move the story from infinity to L. I don't even have to do the moving here. This, should just, this is probably a triviality. Let me, let me see if I can prove the global Langlands conjectures for GL1 just off the top. Uh, yeah, you see, this contains, if I've got a p adic continuous representation here, k infinity star circle, that kind of looks a bit like r to the power. This is a real smooth thing, right? And this is a p adic thing, so there aren't going to be any continuous maps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is great. This is a, this is a theorem. This is a theorem of me. <laughs> I just proved it now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It was probably known before me. The point is, if I, if I look at a continuous map from this thing here to some p-adic thing, then it can be completely crazy about the primes above p. But at infinity, this must just be trivial, right? So you don't even have to do what they did. You just say, this is trivial on this thing here, and it's continuous, so it's trivial on the closure of this thing here, and that's the Galois group. So in fact, the, this, this p-adic global lineless conjectures for GL1 over k, they're just as easy as like the classical local lineless conjectures, because the groups just turn out to be the same. So uh, there's, there's that, right? So what's the problems with this picture? This is fantasy. This isn't a bijection. This is a guiding principle. This is a proper theorem. This is something that makes sense. Both sides make sense, and there's relationships between them. Uh, and this is just some strange definition, uh, and this just seems to be some triviality. Uh, so there's the big picture. And so as I say, you mustn't, there's some colorful, let me, let me just grey out, let me grey out the things that don't really make much sense. And the, don't make, the things that don't make much sense are kind of here, right? That's a bit of a lie. Uh, so now I'm going to do that really bad thing that lecturers sometimes do, that really kind of annoy the audience. And I'm just going to change all the ones to ends. And there's no possible way that you can take notes, right? So there's an N, there's an N. Uh, so on this side, all the GL1s turn into GLNs. Uh, and on this side, all the one-dimensional representations turn into n-dimensional representations of n-dimensional adic representations. Uh, da, 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 da. That is so, I'm not going to do it. I can't do it. I'm, I, <laughs> I'm going to write it down again, just to slow me down. Uh, I just, it's just, the picture's too, impo the picture's too important for me to just... So we've got automorphic representations, I'll just be brief, of G, L, N over K. And now here we've got n-dimensional complex representations of the global Langlands group. And here we've got algebraic automorphic representations of G, L, N over K. And here we've got compatible systems Compatible systems of L adic of n dimensional L adic representations. Right? And then down here we've got little P adic automorphic representations of, of, of GLN over K. And then here we just have one, just like we had one dimensional, one, re this compatible system is infinitely many representations. At the top we've only got one, one, we've only got one representation, so I'll just go with one representation here, right? Uh, some p-adic, p-adic Gawa, so a continuous p-adic Gawa representation, right? Gal k bar of a k to g l n of q p bar, or c p or something, I don't know, c p, whatever. That's the completion of, no, yeah, it's the completion of QP bar. Uh, uh, oh, we've got an inclusion here. Because given, yeah, because given a compatible system of L adic representations for all L, we just take the P adic one. Uh, right, so, and then of course we've got ma things match up here, right? This is the, <laughs> there. So that's the, that's the global landers conjecture. That's like, I can stop now. That's, that was my job, to tell you this picture. So, uh, what are the problems with this picture? Well, the first problem is that this doesn't exist, and so this map doesn't make any sense. So that's kind of off limits, 
And as I say, the reason it's there is not because we're just naive fools. The reason it's there is because this is a guiding principle. Uh, I haven't given you a definition of automorphic representation, but that's next. That's the next thing we do. We're going to find out what this is. Okay? And in that, we saw it for GL1. I owe it you for GLN. Right? That's the last thing I'm going to do, is I'm going to try and convince you is that an automorphic representation for GLN over K is not remotely a scary thing. Okay? Just like I spent an entire hour and a half today trying to convince you that Grerson characters were not scary things. This is not a scary thing. There's some notion of what it means to be algebraic. The algebraic ones live inside. This exists, right? Now, this arrow here, this is kind of an interesting arrow. I'll put a little star by that arrow, because that side makes sense, although I haven't defined it yet, but we will. That side makes sense. That side makes sense. So there is a chance that we can formulate some kind of conjecture, right? And that would be really good. And that conjecture was formulated by someone that didn't get anywhere near enough press. This conjecture was formulated by a guy called Laurent Clozel, right, in 1990. He formulated a conjecture. He formulated the notion of what it meant for an automorphic representation to be algebraic. And, and this we had already. He, he defined that side... And he made that conjecture, and the great thing about that conjecture is in 1990, finally, the global Langlands conjectures actually incorporated a statement which had some real meaning, right? Both sides were defined, and you could even say how it should match up, like characteristic polynomial of Frobenius should match up with some Sataki parameter or whatever. Right? That has some meaning. And now after 1990, we have this side here. And this side here, we have another problem. And the problem is kind of on the other side. One problem is I've lost my orange chalk. That's, uh, that's the most serious problem. Ah, here it is. Uh, and the problem with this side is that this doesn't make sense. There's no definition. Right? There's no such thing as a p-adic automorphic representation of GLN. Have you got a question, or are you just stretching? Um, so, just in the mathematical case, what does that inclusion mean? Which one? The inclusion of p-adic plane, which is slightly larger, slightly larger. This one, or the other one? The second one. The second one. Uh, the second one means the following thing. These bijet with these, these live in these, and these bijet with these, and so it must be true. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think given, right? I think the, the, the actual answer must be, I've got an algebraic automorphic representation chi, and doesn't that give me chi p via this construction of V? Okay. Over here? Oh, but this is okay. This is a land radic representation for all lambda. Then you just choose one of them. Oh, yeah, that's not a very good idea, is it? Well, maybe it is. If I, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I've got a compatible system of n dimensional L adic representations in a box and I just take one of them out, then I, from that one representation, I can figure out the characteristic polynomials of Frobenius for all primes p outside some bad set, right? And those characteristic polynomials, by Brow and Nesbitt, they tell me the representation, but those characteristic polynomials are the same for all these representations in this family. So now if I take another one out, I know what the char polys are on a dense set, so by continuity I know what they are on everything, so by brownness, but I know it. So if I know one of these compatible systems, I know all of them. So all that's happening here is this is an inclusion. The map is a, for it's a forgetful functor or something, right? Given a compatible system, I'm taking one. And then the remark is, given one, it might not be part of a compatible system, so I'm going to write it as an inclusion. What do you reckon? You're not happy? You're confused? Yeah, there is a notion of strongly compatible. I, no, I don't think so. 
I think there's, there's weakly compatible and there's incredibly super, super strongly compatible. And the conjecture is that they're all the same and I just can't be bothered to get bogged down in the details. But I don't think that, I can't believe I answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's very brave of you. Can you think of one? Yeah, that's why they're hard to think of. So, but, ah, I see, sorry. But, so, so this, this condition here has nothing to do with being geometric or algebraic. Which one, which one, which one? Going from here to here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I... I, this is, I just don't understand why this has got anything to do with it. I don't see. I don't see a copy of the complex numbers in that definition. I don't see a copy of the complex numbers in that definition. I don't see any complex numbers anywhere at all uh, below this line. Below this line. Oh, no, that's not true. There's some there. There's, below that line there. I don't see any... I don't see any complex numbers. And you're asking about this and this, so I'm slightly perplexed as to why you're mentioning the complex numbers at all. You've got it. Anyone, while we're here, I've got, 50, I've got barely any material in 15 minutes. Any other questions? You're all being videoed live, remember? So you ask a dumb question and, like, that's... <laughs> maybe, maybe you should ask me at the end if you've got any questions. Oh, great. What? Oh, I see. Oh, okay. So go on. You can ask as dumb a question as you like. No one even knows who you are. <laughs> Hello, random audience member. Ask a question that nobody can hear. So why is it your dream to have this version of I don't know, because you have to have dreams. No, no, I understand that, but I'm just wondering if you think there's a larger context in which Langlands should apply to Piatic on Morphic forms or something like that, or you just like Piatic? All these theorems about base change and automorphic induction and stuff are all really, really hard harmonic analysis, right? And they've all been proved assuming this picture as a motivating picture, right? This, this is a motivating picture, and it, but also a meaningless statement, but it tells us what theorems to prove about these objects here. Uh, and similarly, this picture here is a completely meaningless is a completely meaningless thing, right? But on the other hand, I am motivated by this meaningless bijection uh, to attempt to do two things, right? Firstly, I want to give a definition. Because proving a theorem is hard, but sometimes giving a definition can be quite easy. So sometimes I think about what the definition might be. So that just gives me something to do. But, but that's, that's not my main point. I think my main point is, once I realized that Tate's gadgets here were somehow living in some families, living in complex analytic families, right, see, the, uh, this, is, this is a strange, this, the middle thing here is, pro, you know, is prime independent. This middle thing, where everything makes sense, is a beautiful, is a beautiful collection of conjectures, and then up here we say, now let's get all complexy, and down here we say, now let's get all piadicy. And so there is some sort of symmetry, but here I've shown that, kind of, Tate, Tate showed that these guys here lived in kind of families. And so I should believe that these guys here live in families. Uh, and these guys here definitely live in families because they're called spec R, right? You take some mod P representation, you deform it, and you get, you, you get some representation to GLN of some big ring R, and it's called R, it's always called R, and it's the universal deformation ring, and it's a, it's a geometric object. And so when we even have fragmentary definitions of P, like, I don't know what a periodic automorphic representation for GLN over K is, but I know what a periodic modular form is, 
And I'm pretty convinced that uh, an overconvergent periodic modular form should be an example of this. Okay, and so I'm now motivated to take, did, for GL1 over K, Tate put these into a complex analytic family, so why don't I try and put these into a periodic analytic family? And so I kind of thought, why, you know, maybe eigenvarieties should exist for a huge class of connected reductive groups. I mean, you, this, you've got to understand, there's some point in history where we only had the eigen curve. We had, we had Tate, and then we had the Eigen curve, and then that was it. And there was me thinking about this. It was like, how in a minute? Maybe there's more than the Eigen curve. Like, where are you going to go after the Eigen curve? And I just tried really, really hard to write down potential definitions and then prove that they lived in periodic families. It's just what I've spent my life doing, really. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you're right, it's all pointless. But, you know, you, I mean, we know. It's all, it's, yeah. It's, it's just me trying to work out what we should prove, right? But, you, you know, in 1980, we'd never seen HEDA families, and then he just came along. It's like, no way, look, they move in families. Like, it's just a special, I don't know, it all fits together. Hello. Okay, that's my confusion again. Yeah, great. So the size and size, we don't like, conjecturally, it's the same as geometric uh, periodic representations. Yeah. Okay, so your inclusion is simply like forgetting them on the geometry. Yeah. Yeah, I can work out which ones. Yeah, that's another conjecture, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's great. This is no, no periodic Hodge theory, right? So given a representation here, we could ask if it's potentially semi-stable or Durham or Hodge-Tate, okay? And if the answer to all of those questions is yes, then this thing here should conjecturally be part of a compatible system. No, if I demand, no, right, for, for this bijection here, I don't even want Hodge Tate. This is anything, right? This is, this is norm, this is norm to the S for S in CP, and this is norm to the S for S in CP, or whatever, right? This is just, you know, this is just some, my, my complex number family has become some piatic, piatic family. So here, there's no piatic Hodge theory condition at all. Here, there's no piatic Hodge theory condition at all, right? Continuous representations, crazy things with no piatic Hodge theory. What about the ones with piatic Hodge theory? That's the fontaine maser conjecture. That's the answer to your question, right? fontaine maser conjecture. We're getting somewhere. Thanks for pushing. Uh, if I've got rho, gal k bar over k, to gln of e, where e over, q, e over qp finite, okay, this representation here, if this is continuous, semi-simple, unramified outside a finite set, unramified outside a finite set, set of places and uh, and potentially semi-stable so that is a word that I really don't want to say too much about that's something about piadic Hodge theory okay that says the behavior of Rho restricted to the absolute Galois group of K P bar over K P for P dividing P this same P here, L equals P in this story. So this is a complicated periodic Hodge theory condition, and we've got an expert on periodic Hodge theory in the room, Rebecca. If anyone wants to ask, you know, if anyone wants to find out what it is, ask Rebecca. Or we'll look in a book. Huh? Yeah, that's going to be the that's that's going to be what distinguishes between them, isn't it? This is this is the this is the correct. We're just thinking about this inclusion. We're, we're thinking about this inclusion. So this stuff here, all periodic representations. So this there. So this needs a name, right? Let's call this 
unramified outside a finite set of places, that means not completely insane, right? If you're, like, if you're ramified at infinitely many places, that's not number theory, okay? But then potentially semi-stable is some, that means that Hodge theory gives you a bunch of whole, like Hodge take weights of a periodic Gower representation are whole numbers. So this is some kind of, this means that a random bunch of periodic numbers turn out to be whole numbers, which is just the same as here, right? Just the same. What did it mean for an automobile representation to be algebraic? It meant a random bunch of complex numbers were all whole numbers. Okay? Potentially semi-stable, this implies your Hodge Tate, right? And Hodge Tate means that your set operator, which has some random periodic numbers as eigenvalues, those eigenvalues are all whole numbers, right? So this means a bunch of a bunch of periodic numbers. Our whole numbers are in Z, right? So that's the definition of this must be what it means for a periodic Gower representation to be algebraic. That must be the definition. Okay, that's probably not a standard thing. I think some people call this geometric in the literature. That's a terrible, that's a terrible name. This should be called algebraic. Okay, so if rho is an algebraic, P, there's only one P, yeah? Only one P, not compatible system, only one P. If I've got rho like this, this should imply, this is a big conjecture, this should imply that rho comes from a motive, <laughs> which is a meaningless statement because motives don't, I mean, it's much less meaningless than the global Langlands group. At least we know examples of motives. I'm not entirely sure we know any examples of elements of the global language group. Right? Implies that rho comes from a motive, and that implies that rho is part, because a motive, you can have l adic representation. A motive is just like, the, and, you know, an elliptic, it means an algebraic variety, right? It's just, it's people who want to look really clever call algebraic varieties. That's what a motive is. Uh, rho comes from a motive, implies that rho is part of a compatible system. Of, of l adic representations. Have I answered your question? I think that's it now, right? This is, this, we've now, we've nailed it. So there's some strange symmetry. Is this just symmetry, right? Everything's supposed to match up on both sides. We've got complex analytic stuff here. We demand some integrality condition. We've got periodic analytic stuff here. We demand some integrality condition, modulo the fact that there's no definition. See, for GL1, there's a definition. I gave you a definition for GL1, and I can tell you exactly what that integrality condition is, right? You've got this really, you know, imagine, right? Look, I'll, I'll show you. This is another important thing, isn't it? Uh, let's do GL1. Let's do a. Let, let me show you. I've got a periodic automorphic representation. Let's do K is Q, and let's do L equals P. And I've got a periodic automorphic representation. So I've got A Q star over Q star uh, to via some continuous chi uh, to a periodic automorphic representation. So th this will go to let's just go like Q P, you know, whatever Q P star. That's what we'll see. Whatever C P star or, or Q whatever whatever one. Take the thing you're least scared of, right? Q P bar star. They, they'll all be fine. They're all periodic automorphic representations. You know, these ones are defined over QP and whatever. So I've got a periodic automorphic representation for GL1 over K. So now let's have a look. Chi restricted to ZP star. So ZP star lives in QP star. That's a local, that's one completion of Q. So that lives in here, just to the place above P, right? So ZP star lives in QP star, lives in this global thing here. So I can restrict chi to ZP star. Are you happy with that? What, what will that look like? I've gone off topic here, because I'm not supposed to be talking about the periodic Langlands philosophy. Uh, but still, chi restricted to ZP star, this is a continuous group homomorphism from ZP star to CP star, right? So if I take a periodic automorphic representation, then I restrict it to ZB star, I get a continuous group homomorphism from ZP star to CP star. So in my mind, that says the eigenvariety for GL1 over K has a map down to weight space, right? This is 
i.e. this is what some people call a weight. Because Robert Coleman considered the set of all such things and called that set weight space. Right, that's a p-adic weight, and lo and behold, it contains maps of the form x goes to x to the power n for n an integer, right? And it also contains maps of the form x goes to x to the power n times chi of x, where chi is a finite order character. Right? So really, you could look at the derivative of this map, the p-adic derivative of this map near the origin, and you're getting, you see. So we could look at the, we could look at the derivative, d by d chi, d by, well, d by d s of chi, at s equals 1, right? That's just going to be, or whatever a good name for a complex number is, s equals 1. That's going to be, is going to be in Cp, right? I'm saying locally for a small number, this is x goes to x to the n for some n in Cp, right? And algebraic, that just means this number has to be, this number has to be in z, Right? So there's the definition of an algebraic p-adic automorphic representation for GL1. So it's just the same story, but instead of a complex number being in Z, I've got some p-adic number in Z. They're all the conjecturally the same, right? Yeah, I could say that if you like. We can have super, super weakly compatible systems, and we can have super, super ultra, ultra strongly compatible systems. Right. I just want to make sure I understand that like, the, what's happening at times L9 equals P somehow has something to do with the program at L equals P. You can choose, right? I think the question is, you should also impose conditions at P. Yeah, I could do. I think, that condition, I think that conjecturally, all the conditions you want to put at P are implied by the incredibly weak assertion that I'm compatible. Right? Isn't that how it works? Have I missed a trick? Weakly compatible systems and strongly, that's what we're asking about. It's up to, I didn't put one. I know, I'm going to say super weakly then. The, 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 I'm in safe ground here, right? Because these are only conjectures. So for every definition of compatible system, we have a conjecture. So I'm going to, I'm going to make all those conjectures at once, and I'm going to furthermore say that uh, the weakest notion of compatible system you can think of should imply the strongest notion of compatible system you can think of. I'm going to throw that in as part of the conjecture. I think that's how it works. Because they all match up with automorphic representations. Uh, so anyway, that one board, that, that's just like, if you take one thing home from this uh, conference, for this whatever it is, it's, it's that, that's how I think it all fits together. All right, and then secretly, these come in families, these are meaningless, these come in families, these are discrete. Right, this is Z, yeah, this is Z, and this lives in C, which is smoothly C-bearing, and this is Z, and it also lives in CP, which is periodically smoothly varying. And these should have some nice, come in nice periodic families that match up with the periodic families that are clearly here. And uh, I mean, this would come in nice, if we actually had a definition, this would come in complex families, probably. But uh, yeah, but then this is some abstract, yeah, I don't know. That's what I think the world looks like. Uh, so the main, as far as you're concerned, the main problem with this is that we haven't got a definition of automorphic representation. So clearly, I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't define automorphic representations and tell you some basic things about them. So that's what's left.